Thanks for joining us. Welcome everyone to today's webinar, GDPR Postmortems, Lessons Learned from Google, Equifax, Facebook, and others. I'd like to introduce our presenter. Joining us today is Scott Giordano, VP of Data Protection at Spirion. Scott's a highly regarded data privacy attorney with over 20 years of experience. Welcome, Scott. Please take it away. Wonderful. Thank you, Abby. Good morning, everyone. So let's uh, talk about our agenda. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about who enforces data protection in the EU, and we're going to go through some case studies, Google, Facebook, Uber, and Equifax. And while Google may be the uh, the most prominent just because of the scope of the fine, really you're going to find that the most details are going to be in Equifax. But uh, we're going to talk about all of these. Uh, they're all fascinating cases, and uh, the past is prologue, so uh, this is certainly not the last we're going to see. So with that, Abby, if you go to the next slide. If you leave with nothing else today, organizational control is just as important as technical ones. When I say organizational, I mean policies and procedures. Most failures uh, described in this webcast here are attributable to basic security and privacy failures and poor coordination among organizational team members, not advanced threats, which you probably hear about a lot in the news. And then, yeah, stipulate into contract terms regarding data protection that you can't support will come back to haunt you. That is uh, much of the story of Equifax, as we'll um, do in a, in a little bit. And then I think we had one more point here before we go on. Yeah, security plus privacy is data protection. You'll hear me use the phrase data protection a lot. And that is because that really is the new discipline. And if you've been on any of my webcast previously, you know that I, I tend to use that phrase a lot. That's the new discipline because that's the, the European Union used that back in 95 with the uh, European Data Protection Directive. They use the idea of security and privacy as one discipline, so we're going to do the same here. And that concept is certainly spreading throughout the US and, and North America. So with that, let's go to the next slide. So bad news and good news. Bad news is that since May 25th, I can't believe it's been that long already, it seems like it was yesterday, that there's been no security privacy audit guidelines. And, and those of you that have spent time auditing against frameworks or things of that nature know that you're always looking for an audit guideline like a uh, NIST standard 53A or something like that so that you have something to work with otherwise you really have to just rely on your experience. There's been no audit guidelines from the uh, European Data Protection Board which is the chief think tank and sometimes law enforcement officer of the EU for privacy um, nor is any on the horizon. No guidelines from any of the, the 28, uh, soon to be 27 we think, EU supervisory authorities However, the sanctions from Equifax do give us a great roadmap, and so I'm going to spend a, probably a disproportionate time on Equifax today. There's just a lot of content, I and mean, you could probably write a security manual just on the basis of Equifax. So, other authorities in the EU and elsewhere either will be reading it or have read it, and uh, you can bet that they're going to take that to heart. So, with that, let's go to the next slide. I want to talk about who enforces data protection, just because this is something, a uh, question that is not always clear what the answer is. So you have the 28 EU member supervisory authorities. So the ICO in the UK, for example, which will be the subject for most of these, and the CNIL in France, which um, is their privacy police, if you will. But every EU member nation has privacy police. We don't really have that here in the US. The, the, the closest thing we have is the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, and then at the state level, you have uh, the state's attorneys general. But we really, and, and some states like California now have a privacy uh, department, if you will, or other uh, mechanism. But by and large, it's still really enforced by the AG's office. So European Commission, however, can, afford, can enforce privacy indirectly. So uh, WhatsApp, probably most of you on the call here have WhatsApp on your phone. When Facebook bought WhatsApp, they told the European Commission twice, the antitrust folks twice, we're not going to integrate uh, the two. Uh, we'll keep... Uh, WhatsApp separate. That, of course, was not the case. Uh, it proved to be counter to the truth, and uh, the European Commission was not amused. They fined them 110 million euros, which, not pocket change, but um, not a killer, but still significant. Also, there is a European Court of Human Rights. This is a, another way to go. It's not common, but you can go that way. And they address the European Convention on Human Rights. Just recently, uh, last year, UK lost a um, privacy action in the court on, based on surveillance that was revealed through the Snowden case, and uh, now that's going to the, uh, the highest court of the European Court of Human Rights, so ostensibly to end this whole mass surveillance program they have. So we'll see where that goes. Let's go to the next slide, Abby. 
So since May 25th, and this is according to DLA Piper, which is a well-respected law firm, uh, in the eight months since GDPR, about 59,000 breaches have been reported. So that's pretty serious. Unfortunately, we don't know how many complaints have been filed. What we do know that is on the first day of the deadline, if you will, or the first day, I guess, of enforcement, May 25th, four complaints were filed by noyb.eu. That's none of your business. And uh, one of which was, ta-da, let's go, Abby, the next slide. It is, you guessed it. That's right, it's Google. So this was filed with the CNIL, which is the French Data Protection Authority. And you may say, wait a minute, Scott, Google is... European operations are headquartered in Ireland, shouldn't it have been filed there? And in fact, the Keneal offered it to Ireland and they said, no, you take it. So, And I'm being a little glib here, but that's basically what happened. So what's the substance of it? it three things, or really two and a half things. So you had violations of transparency and necessary information. So meaning, think of a, of a privacy statement, okay, or the kind of information you get with the terms and conditions, and then necessary information, information you need to make decisions about whether you're going to consent to certain things, and then violations of consent in and of itself. So you really had two and a half, however, however you want to articulate it, different violations here. Ultimately, they were fined 50 million euros, so less than the 110 million that the European Commission did a little bit ago, but on Facebook, but still significant. And yes, to the right, you can see this is the copy of the, the, the complaint in English and French. So if we go to the next slide, let's talk about transparency. So when they talk about transparency, essentially uh, the information that, that you need is scattered all across the place. So you have to uh, click on probably five, six places to get all the information you need about what Google is doing with your information. And so they said here, processing are particularly massive, intrusive, because the number of services offered, which is about 20, and the amount and nature of data processed and combined. So essentially, just too difficult to get an idea. You have to go to too many clicks to go and find what's going on. Go to the next slide, Abby. So how does this map to GDPR? Because here's what's fascinating about the fine that the uh, Keneal gave. They never cite any particular article. You have to look that up yourself, which I thought was kind of odd. But Articles 12 and 13, that's transparency. And I quoting a couple things here. One is that for Article 12, the information you have to share has to be concise, transparent, intelligible, easily accessible, clear and plain language. That did not pass the test here in this case. And Google was just too much, too many documents, too much to read, too much to connect the dots, essentially. And then Article 13, talking about sharing the purposes, the legal basis, the recipients, and the fact the controller uh, intends to transfer personal data to a third country. Now, there's more, way more to Article 13. There's a lot more. However, I highlighted those things because those are great opportunities for you and the audience to get into trouble. Uh, you have to articulate the purpose of the processing. And I've had endless discussions with clients about how specific do you have to make it. Do you make it really specific so you're telling the, the end user, but then what happens if you want to do something different? Then you have to go back and ask them. Or do you make it very general? And usually what you'll find is that it's somewhere in between. You're making it general enough that it covers some things that maybe are not exactly thought of at the moment, but it's specific enough that, that people can make a, a rational decision. So that's always a challenge. So all these points are important challenges. You'll face them um, whenever you develop a privacy statement. Let's go to the next slide here. So other issue is consent, and this maps to Article 6. There's a concept in EU law we don't have here yet in the U.S., but we, I suspect we will. It's called a legal basis, meaning a legal foundation or, or a legal principle upon which the processing of personal data is founded. So there's six different types, but I've highlighted the three that you're going to most likely run into. It's either going to be consent, meaning literally you're giving consent. You, you're all clicked on those I agree terms and conditions on your iPhone or your Android phone. Contract, meaning that you bought something and someone needs to know where you live so they can ship it to you or a legitimate interest to the controller, which is this really loosey-goosey concept that I could do an entire webcast on, but I won't, uh, at least not yet. So if we go to the next slide, we will talk about consent in this context. So here, consent uh, is the purported legal basis in the Google case. It must be specific, must be unambiguous. There is a, a uh, ads personalization section. And it says here, um, it's not possible to be aware of the plurality of services. Now, this is from the Keneal report. So, not possible to be aware of the plurality of services, websites, and applications involved in these processing operations. So, said another way, there are so many different things going on, you have no idea uh, what is being done with your data on a, a per-application basis, if you will. So, that fails the specific, fails the unambiguous requirements. Also, in the 
ads personalization section, some of the options were pre-checked. That's a big no-no. That's, that's privacy 101. You don't pre-check anything. You always let your customer check the boxes. That was a no-no. GDPR requires specific consent for each purpose. Here, it was one consent for everything. Again, we're typically used to this here in the U.S., but the um, EU does not like this. Let's change gears. Let's go to Facebook. So Facebook Cambridge Analytica. Last year, towards the end of last year, in fact, the ICO, Information Commissioner's Office, fined Facebook about half a million pounds for lack of transparency and security issues related to the harvesting of data. So that was the maximum at the time they could have filed. And if we um, keep going, Abby, I think I've got more content on this slide. I apologize, uh, team. I, I probably should have not used builds here. So um, what I said here is that uh, Facebook failed to keep personal information secure because it failed to make suitable checks on apps and developers using its platform. Well, and we know who those folks are. That became a big issue. One of these persons is Dr. Alexander Kogan. We'll see more about him in a bit. Harvested uh, Facebook data of up to 87 million people worldwide without their knowledge. So yes, that did not go over well. And those of you who are perhaps wondering in what context this all took place. This was in the uh, elections back in 2015, 2016 for Brexit and for the US election here. And so obviously those were controversial and uh, these folks played a role, hence the overall controversy. Abby, let's see if there's any more content here. Otherwise we'll go to the next slide and we'll take a deep dive. So let's go to the next slide here. So here's a story, you may have heard this. So back in 2013, so this goes back quite a ways, Dr. Alexander Kogan and Global uh, Science Research created an app that became known as This Is Your Digital Life. Those are your Facebook users. I'm sure you, you've seen this in the past, used in conjunction with Facebook. So here's the deal, though. This app was getting information that was personal from the users and, and, and from per, their Facebook friends without the friend's permission. So what was the personal data collected? Here's a list. If we go to the next slide, you'll see a list of all the personal data. And it's a, it's a long one. So, yep, you got birth date and current city. It, it, I won't read all these to you, but the net net of it is it was a lot of, of personal information that you were getting not just from the users who use the app, but you were also getting it from the friends of the friends. So this is the information. Yep, email, all kinds of things. So yeah, just, just lots and lots of stuff. If we go to the next page here, by September 2015, app had been used by about 300,000 users, estimated information about 87 million folks worldwide. So here's what happened. And again, those of you that follow this story, now this is probably starting to ring some bells here. So this was shared with different organizations. It was shared in, with SCL Elections Limited and Cambridge Analytica. You're likely familiar with those folks since SCL allegedly controls Cambridge Analytica, also shared with some others as well I won't go into. So if we go to the next slide here, this did not go over well. What happened is that uh, May of 2014, Kogan gave uh, to Facebook an undertaking that the app was being used uh, only for research, not on a commercial basis. An undertaking is, is another way of saying a pledge, okay, or a promise, if you will. Evidently not something we say here in the U.S. But it was a pledge or a promise not to do it. Of course, he actually did so. He did, did that in breach of the undertaking. He did share it on a commercial basis. So 2015, the Guardian newspaper reveals this, okay? Political campaigning is being used on the basis of this, of, on this data that was collected illegally. And so Facebook terminated the app's access rights. ICO subsequently investigated this and found violations of two data protection principles. So remember, where, where this all took place before GDPR went down, but the principles map very nicely to GDPR. So if we go to the next slide. On the left, here's the DPAs, data protection principles, the articles, if you will. This is from the uh, Data Protection Act of 1998 that was replaced last year by the, the DPA of uh, 2018. So what you have here is you've got these principles, eight principles, and you can look on the right. They all map to the GDPR uh, in different ways. In fact, number seven, to be secure, maps to multiple places on GDPR. And here it was articles one, article seven, article one, fairly and lawfully. You're going to see that all over this presentation I'm doing, and you'll see that in subsequent violations as well, because it's easy to violate the fairness portion of this, and, and the FTC uses this angle all the time to, to punish organizations that violate U.S. privacy. Also, be, to be secure, you tend to think of security as, oh, I need to put in a firewall, or I need to put in encryption, or what have you. In this case, uh, not the case at all. It's all about organizational controls, as I mentioned earlier. So if we go to the next slide, 
So two principles here. Principle one, I mentioned earlier, this is going to be uh, the legality or lawfulness or fairness. So it was unfair to friends of Facebook users, no way to know what's going to happen with their personal data. The, the original friend consents on behalf of someone else because frankly it's just unclear what data was being collected. So the consent took place was not freely given, specific, or informed. You will see that phrase used a lot because it's a very low hurdle, if you will, to violate. Conversely, it's very tough to make sure that you're getting consent right, to making sure the information that you give for consent elicits a freely given, specific, or informed consent. So um, as a consequence, no lawful basis for processing. No lawful basis means everything else you did afterwards doesn't matter if the basis was not lawful. So this is how they got Facebook as it were. Now I'll talk about security. Facebook didn't review the terms and conditions of the app, this is your digital life app, and to see if it was consistent with Facebook's policies. And then Facebook didn't take steps to monitor whether the app was being used in a manner that was consistent with the policies. So you can see that you've got these, these two issues it's not a traditional InfoSec issue where you're concerned about a firewall or MFA or what have you. It's all about are you policing your third parties? And in this case, they clearly were not being policed. Let's go to the next slide. So there's also a company in Canada connected to this called Aggregate IQ. Oh, let's back up one. Aggregate IQ in Canada uh, was implicated, uh, and the um, ICO told them to stop processing this personal data, and uh, Aggregate IQ told the ICO to get lost. So we're going to see where this leads. I thought that was interesting. A nice test of extraterritorial power. The parent company, SCL Elections, was criminally charged and um, fined at 15,000 pounds. So not terribly much, uh, at least by U.S. standards, but they did get charged. Then let's talk about Uber. So what happened with Uber? Back in 2016, so between uh, October, November 2016, personal data around 2.7 million UK customers was accessed from a cloud-based storage system operated by Uber's US parent company. This is going to sound familiar when we talk about Equifax. The ICO uh, investigation found what's called credential stuffing, which folks is not terribly sophisticated. You're basically stealing information from one site and then plugging in another site and seeing if it works. And so that's what they did. The customers and drivers were not told about the incident for more than a year. That's a big no-no. Uber paid the attackers $100,000 to destroy the data. So uh, good luck with that. Uh, ultimately, they were fined 385,000 pounds. Now, would it have been more under GDPR? Almost certainly, but uh, this is what they were fined. So let's, let's take a, a deeper dive into this. This is a fascinating story. And again, you may have followed this in the news. So back to our mapping here. We showed you, and we'll use this one again, for the data protection principles, Article 7 must be secure. And you can see how that maps to the relevant GDPR sections, especially Articles 5, which people tend to blow right past when they look at GDPR, they go right to Article 32. So let's go to the next slide, and we'll take a deeper dive into this. Okay, so threat actors or bad actors, whatever you want to call them, use credential stuffing against GitHub. And so... I'm probably all of you know GitHub. So what happened is that Uber employees had accounts on GitHub, um, and so you, this credential stuffing, essentially uh, the attackers just kept trying different pairs of user IDs and passwords. They stole from somewhere else until they obtained access. So they got into GitHub, and then from there got credentials to get into the Uber, Amazon S3 store, and then got the records from 32 million users, including 2.7 or so million UK users. So what, ha what was compromised? Well, um, name, mobile, email address, some GPS data, evidently the GPS point at which you were when you activated the, uh, the program. So the actors demanded and received $100,000. So um, they made a payday. Uber delayed notifying the ICO for a year. So I mentioned earlier, not, not really a, a particularly good idea to not do that. Also didn't mention it to people who were affected. Let's go to the next slide. So here's a list of failures, and I, I love the list of failures in these documents that the ICO and Camille and others publish because it's really a roadmap for what not to do or conversely for what to do if you want to start putting in controls that you don't already have. Um, no MFA, no multi-factor authentication for use with GitHub. So, uh, and also the access credentials for the S3 were stored in plain text. So once they got in, they got in, it was no problem. Uh, the devs at, at Uber, 
just use their personal email addresses as you use your IDs. So right away, you've created essentially a single point of failure. No MFA for the S3 accounts. So that was a bad idea. S3 account credentials were not rotated with any regularity, although evidently there, there was a procedure to do so. It just never was done. Uber treated the security failure as a bug bounty instance. So those of you, again, I presume all of you know bug bounties, but if you don't, the idea that you'll pay someone to reveal bugs that are in your, your code stack. For whatever reason, they chose to use the bug bounty, presumably to keep the bad guys quiet. So they treated that as a bug bounty rather than as a crime. None of the affected persons were notified. The ICO found out through news reports. Here is a, a great piece of legal analysis. If the authorities find out through the news, you're probably in big trouble. So the fine, 385,000 pounds. So again, this was pre, just before GDPR went down, but the same principles apply. You saw that mapping I did earlier. We're going to be using that again because uh, it's a great way to give you a, the big picture of, of how old principles map right on to new. So mitigating factors, and this is important too. This is just as important as the, the mess-ups here. So Uber UK was not aware of the breach at the time it occurred. It was a um, Uber US that was. So um, in my view, that's not a mitigating factor. That's actually an aggravating factor, but put that aside. No evidence compromised data was used for criminal activity. That's true. But then again, that doesn't necessarily mean that it didn't fall into the hands of bad guys like intelligence agencies. So I'm a little dubious about that. What was not compromised were, were other things like trip location history, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's great. Uber did take prompt remedial action, so good for them. They should have done that anyway. And the attack against GitHub rather than a failure of Uber systems, again, I'm a little dubious about this contention. I, frankly, I think Uber should have, have had stronger, including MFA on their own. But this is per the ICO, so you can see what their view is. Abby, before we go to Equifax, questions from the audience. Yes, Scott, we do have a question. Sure. Was paying the hackers effectively a ransom to destroy stolen data an ICO violation in itself? That is, a, is the question of the hour. I am not aware that paying ransom is per se illegal. If it was, they would have likely gotten a hit for that. So I'm going to guess to say it's not. I think it makes great sense to make it illegal. I know here in the U.S. it's not, at least at this point. If you think about how many uh, ransomwares took place against uh, medical institutions, and against law enforcement agencies, and they had to pay the ransom. So the net net of it is I doubt that it is, uh, it is illegal. You can make a, a great argument, though, that um, if you are subject to SOX, then it is a per se weakness in your uh, controls, and you have to report to the SEC if you're a multinational. But um, as far as this is per se legal, I do not believe so. Great, thank you. And friendly reminder to all attendees, you can enter questions in the GoToWebinar console at any time throughout the rest of the presentation. Yes, also any questions we don't get to because we got a lot of emailed to us for signups. We have a blog. Any questions not answered here, I will answer on the blog um, sometime next week while I'm at RSA, uh, probably after Wednesday. So feel free to check to our blog. I have all of the questions posted there that don't get answered here. So let's go to Equifax. Equifax is really the biggest of the four cases that we're, we're studying here today, there's just so much to Equifax. I said earlier, you could use Equifax almost as a framework in and of itself because it's just such a massive case. And it's fascinating, at least for me anyway. So two parties here, you've got Equifax US, you've got Equifax in the UK. They lost control collectively of about 15 million records of UK data subjects. And there's these two data sets they have, uh, EIV and GCS. That'll be important in a little bit. So what was lost here? name, date of birth, address, all kinds of, of fairly sensitive information. Also, data between the UK and US folks was mixed. There was a weakness called, um, or a weakness in the Apache Struts web app framework, okay? And you can see the, the, the name of this thing, CVE 2017. That's the, the name of it from the CVSS score, which I'll talk about in a minute. So they were fined, ultimately, half a million pounds under the Data Protection Act. That was the maximum allowed. Had it been GDPR and they hit the maximum, it would have been 120 million. So definitely a much bigger fine. And then the FTC investigation is still underway. Uh, I know there was congressional investigations as well. And I believe on the resources slide, I have a link to that. So really very good reading for InfoSec. Let's go to the next slide and we'll, we'll dig a bit more into this. So here's the timeline. I'm not going to read all of these, but I want to hit some things here. So March 8, 2017, Department of Homeland Security notifies these folks of this Apache Struts weakness. 
um, the CVSS, Common Vulnerability Scoring System. It's one to 10. 10, 10 is critical, 10 is a four alarm fire. So it means go fix it now. So Equifax notifies the staff and uh, unfortunately their portal doesn't get patched. And here's what's interesting in the report. It says on March 10th, the first interaction using the vulnerability takes place. That's all the report said. It did not go into more detail. So you can read between the lines that whatever bad happened, happened on March 10th. So Equifax tries to patch this thing. They don't. A uh, unauthorized access takes place likely from the 13th of May to July 30th. Equifax discovers the breach, takes the portal offline. They call Mandiant to do the uh, forensic analysis. And Equifax notices or notifies the ICO. A year later, sounds familiar, they notify Equifax Limited, their partner in the UK. So uh, again, the theme of waiting a year to notify folks, it's here as well. Let's go to the next slide. So same chart here, what principles are violated? Well, just about all of them. I mean, six out of the, out of the eight. So you can see the idea of, of fairness um, in terms of the processing of personal data. Or, law, or lawfulness or what have you. You've got the security one as well. Um, it's got to be no, uh, kept no longer than necessary. So these are all principles that map perfectly over to GDPR, especially Article 5. So as I mentioned earlier, this gets skipped a lot. It's part of GDPR. You've got to read it and adhere to it like anything else. So if we go to the next slide, well, I'll take a bit of a deeper dive here. So principle 5, and there's not a, a special order I'm taking these in. These are just things that I feel are, are, are important to talk about. So principle five, don't keep data longer than is necessary. So they took this EIV data set, moved it from the UK to the US, and despite this, the EIV data set, I'm sorry, they had it from the US to the UK, but they, they kept a portion of it in the US, so for no reason. And then another data set, GCS, the folks in the UK didn't really understand why the GCS data set was there to begin with. If you don't know why the data is there or how sensitive it is, why it's being processed, it's hard to really protect it effectively because you don't have that sense of urgency. Equifax in the, in the UK didn't follow up or check to make sure that all the UK data had been removed uh, from the US environment. So you've got the net net of it is you've got data that was in the UK environment, went to the US environment, came back to the, to the UK environment. And when it keeps flipping back and forth like that, it's just it's a great opportunity to lose track of things. And the fact that they didn't know where the data or didn't know why the certain kinds of data were there doesn't bode well at all. Let's go to the next failure. Okay, so um, this is uh, principle seven. This is InfoSec 101. So inf uh, information must be secure. Equifax didn't undertake adequate risk assessment. Um, as probably all of you know, if you don't do a risk assessment before you put together an InfoSec program, a data protection program, it's really hard to get an idea of where to prioritize things. You just start throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks and, and what, what you have budget for. So it doesn't really ignore your benefit if you don't do a risk assessment. They didn't do that in this case. Then there was a data processing agreement or a DPA between Equifax, which was the data controller, and then Equifax here in the US, the processor. So here's the problem is that, and I've read bazillions of DPAs and wrote equal amounts. The problem is that it was inadequate in, in so far as it didn't provide appropriate safeguards for the data going from the UK to the US. So if you don't articulate the safeguards, it's really hard to hold the other party that you're contracting with responsible. And so typically there is a, an appendix on data processing uh, agreements where you will have a long list of controls. I've seen some of these where there'll be 10 pages worth of controls. It's almost like they're just copying the ISO 27K control set. So didn't uh, also include uh, standard contractual clauses. These are the clauses that bind you for the data processing agreement. They're based upon the European Commission standard clauses and you can't change them effectively. So that way it's one size fits all. Let's go to the next slide. So more InfoSec failures. And this is really not good. You, there's an agreement between the two parties and in the agreement it talks about how it being Equifax in the, in the US, the processor deploys extensive technical and organizational security measures to achieve robust information security, blah, blah, blah. So here's the problem with that, folks, is that the worst thing you can do is talk about how great your InfoSec program is, how great your data protection program is, and then not follow through with it. And so that's essentially what happened here is that uh, you have this great program that looks great on paper, but in practice, uh, not so much. 
let's go to the next slide. DPP-8, this is transfer to third countries. This is related to the original um, issue we talked about earlier about organizational controls. This is a specific uh, issue of organizational controls twice. So you have the data processing agreement. We talked about that earlier. It was inadequate, didn't incorporate standard contractual clauses, etc. Also, there was another DPA, and that was inadequate because it failed to provide safeguards for transfers out of the EEA, the European Economic Area. That's essentially the 28 member nations plus three more nations thrown in for, uh, for economic measure. Information going out of that um, was, was not adequately protected from a legal standpoint. And so the commissioner, uh, information commissioner's office, said that these breaches, section seven, section eight, uh, also amounted to a breach of section one because it wasn't fair that the data was not being protected. And you've heard me say this umpteen times, but it bears repeating folks. It's a very low hurdle to clear to tell uh, someone that what they did was unfair to the consumer. So keep that in mind. If they get you on anything, it's not going to be on not using MFA or encryption. It's going to be on being unfair because it's so easy to do. Let's go to the next slide. Failures on the GCS data set, breach of principle one, fairness and unlawfulness, and then breach of principle two in that the relevant data was not being processed for any specified or lawful purpose because the folks in the UK had no idea why the data was there or in some abstract fashion, didn't know why particular data sets were there, really did not inert to its benefit. Because again, if you don't know where the data is there, you don't know why you're processing it. Conversely, whenever um, I worked on uh, data inventories, I always made sure that there was a column that just addressed what kind of processing was taking place and why you were doing it. What was the purpose of it? Because that helped shape the protection strategy. And I always recommend that now, if you develop an information inventory, to make sure that you always include the purpose of the processing. Let's go to the next slide. So security failures. As I mentioned earlier, there's a long list of security failures. I just picked out some favorite ones here because I thought they were especially uh, poignant for this discussion. But I, I urge you all to read this, this entire document. It's got a long list here. So passwords were stored in plain text. Not a good idea. And the commissioner's view is that this is an inappropriate security risk. And yes, I agree. Um, there's no reason to store uh, passwords in plain text. That problem was solved a long time ago. And then this idea that data subjects couldn't have anticipated that their processing would involve storage of passwords in plain text. So again, we're back to fairness because this is InfoSec 101. Also, no consent given by data subjects because there was no way that they would understand that how their data was being processed. Okay, so without consent, uh, without that's adequately specific or informed, you remember that from earlier, same idea, you have a security failure here based on just the principles of fairness. And so on this basis, consent relied upon by Equifax was invalid. So as you know from all the previous discussions we had this morning, that consent is a basis for processing. If you're going to rely on consent, and, and many do, you've got to get it right. It's a fairly high burden to clear because you have to provide the end users with so much useful information. So as a consequence, no, con uh, no consent, no fairness, no lawfulness. Next slide, we'll, we'll do some more here. Penalty calculation. So you have several phases here in any investigation. You'll have a list of the security failures, you'll have a penalty calculation, and then you'll have what are called mitigating and aggravating factors, which is great because, again, this really just is a, a guide for your information security program just by itself. So here are penalty calculations. Again, I'm not going to hit on all of these. You can do that later, but a couple things. The contravention, okay, meaning um, multiple data protection principles were contravened. Several systemic inadequacies in Equifax's technical and organizational measures. So remember that earlier on, we talked about the weakness in the Apache struts. They did a scan. They didn't find the weakness, even though it, were, it remained. So that was an issue. Is they, they did a scan, couldn't find it. And of course, since they couldn't find it, the, um, the problem remained and the, and the vulnerability remained and they were broken into. So you have that. That was systemic, though, at the technical and organizational level. And if you've been on any of my previous webcasts, you know I'm a big fan of organizational controls because they're very cost effective. Here, they just weren't in place. Also, a number of the inadequacies had been in place for a long time. Now, how do you counter that? You counter that by doing audits, so at least a yearly audit, getting an idea of whether your controls are actually working. 
And again, the idea of making sure your controls are working so you can generate reports, so you can say, yes, we have confidence in our controls. And then again, that goes back to SOX and the idea of always not just putting in controls, but testing them to make sure they work. And then the data breach was not detected promptly. It wasn't reported to the commissioner until two months after the event. So this is a theme that runs through almost all of these, and that is that not detecting it promptly and not reporting it promptly, not reporting it promptly is a killer. And uh, this is so, such an easy thing to avoid. Once you find out something's wrong, you've got 72 hours now, get on the phone with the information commissioner or whoever your local DPA is or the attorney general here in the US, it's easier to tell them something with limited information than to wait months or even a year and then come back. It just looks really bad. Let's go to the next slide. Now this is mitigating, and I like mitigating because it gives you an idea of what the uh, Data Protection Authority, the supervisory authority is looking for. So here they said the data itself was not highly sensitive, so it's not like your medical information, for example, or, or your social security number, which can be bad in and of itself. This was on a malicious action on the part of third parties, although I don't necessarily see that as terribly mitigating, kind of protecting yourself because of that. So um, Equifax Limited reported the matter to the commissioner after they got it from the, uh, the Equifax US, but that took a year. So not terribly helpful, but at least they tried. Equifax in the UK deleted at least some of the data before uh, or following the migration, so that was good they got some of it. And then both Equifaxes took steps to minimize uh, consequences by um, hiring Mandiant to go and, uh, and help manage the breach, offer free crediting, uh, credit monitoring services, etc. And then um, both implemented um, certain measures to prevent the recurrence of incidents. So for example, system scanning and um, storing uh, passwords in a cryptographic hash. So uh, that's great. Again, that's InfoSec 101, but nevertheless, it's being done and, and uh, that's giving them credit. So that's something that's a great lesson for all of us is that even after something bad happens, remedial measures will count in your favor. Let's go to the next slide. So here are some aggravating features. Okay, so this impacted um, many more individuals than just the UK folks. So 146 million, many of whom are here in the US, some in Canada, that were, were put uh, at risk here. And these risks persisted for a long time. So we talked about that earlier, that uh, this is something that audits would have addressed. Some of the failures were uh, things that were InfoSec 101, patching, encryption, things that uh, pretty much we've been doing for 30 years now you know, since the internet became popular. And the breach exploited a known vulnerability. I mean, you got a phone call from DHS saying, hey guys, there's a problem here. And it, it probably should have, uh, in fact, I think likely should have been taken a lot more seriously. And then the contractual arrangements between the two parties were, were just inadequate. And I gotta tell you, on this last one, this is something that I saw so many times when I was doing GDPR projects, is that companies were just signing these things and not really understanding what they were signing. They get a data processing agreement in front of them. It had all kinds of requirements, and they just just blindly signed it. And I've seen this so many times. Didn't understand what they're getting themselves into. You know, that if something goes south down the road, that is going to come back to bite them. It really is, and um, it's unfortunate. But this is the world in which we live at the moment. Let us go to the next slide. So before I go into the summary, um, are there comments or questions from the audience, Abby? Hi, yes, there is. Are there any guidelines which explain which technical measures would satisfy the appropriate safeguards requirement? I am so glad you asked that. Unfortunately, as our summary is stating here, there are no published audit guidelines from the European Data Protection Board, nor are any on the horizon. I know I said it's zero, it's really or, but no, there's none on the horizon. So what do you do, okay? Got this question a bazillion times when I worked on GDPR projects. I'm getting for CCPA, and the answer is go back to basics. Go back to, for pure privacy, go back to the GAPP, Generally Accepted Privacy Principles. That's what we used to use way back when, and they're still valid. I mean, admittedly, there's, there's more to it than just what's in those, but highly recommend GAPP. I recommend going back to your favorite framework. So if your favorite framework is ISO 27K, or it's COVID or it's whatever it is, I'm less concerned about the framework than I am about uh, using that as a guide for what you should do. Some frameworks do have an audit standard, like NIST Internet 177 is, um, or 171 for defense contractors. Okay, that has a standard, 171A. So 
that, that has an audit standard, at least you have something to audit against. But if you don't, you're going to really be relying on your experience. And certainly we've got plenty of years of SOX auditing behind us to know that we can rely on that experience as well. So the net net of it is that even though there's no audit guidelines, there's plenty of material out there that you can rely on. There, someone's specifically interested in a good example of a GDPR pop-up for a website or best practices. They're asking, is it better to have a detailed pop-up with agreeing to each category separately rather than a banner, or is there an agree all option the best route to take? I avoid, if you can, the agree all option, even though I see that all the time. Occasionally, I see some really good banners. I mean, they've come a long way in a short time where they'll give you a, a list of, of unchecked checkboxes, and, and that way that you can exactly click on the things that you want to accept and not click on things you don't. That, I think, is going to become the gold standard. I haven't seen anyone punished yet, and I emphasize the word yet, for a deficient uh, warning banner. And let's face it, every website we go to, I don't care where you are in the world, now you get a banner. In terms of good banners, I shamelessly go to law firms' websites and look at their banners because presumably they know what they, they're doing. Not always the case, but they know what they're doing. So I always shamelessly go and, and just borrow theirs, and that's what I've done in the past. But you'll find that you look at so many websites, and you'll get a feel for which banners you like, and you can just simply copy their text. It's not like it's anything that's particularly copyrightable, and use their methodology. So if you have software that allows you to have checkboxes for the different kinds of cookies, by all means, use it. It's, uh, I recommend it. Awesome. Scott, we've received several questions surrounding what are your predictions for U.S. GDPR laws? Well, it's funny you guys mention that because they are rolling in as we speak. Washington State, my, my state, has no fewer than five bills in the legislature right now that are tantamount to our GDPR. CCPA is California's GDPR. New York, let's see, it's New York. Jersey, because it's always Jersey after New York. New York, New Jersey uh, have their version in legislature and Massachusetts uh, has theirs now. So essentially what we're seeing is this tidal wave that's coming through. And I saw this last year with probably 20-ish new laws that came on the books at the state level. We're seeing a flood this year. And normally I wouldn't give much credence to the legislatures and bills because they're mostly political. But this year is different. You're just seeing all of these new laws coming in. And by the end of the year, we're going to have probably a half dozen new GDPRs on the state level. I think there's almost no question about it because it's not a partisan issue. It's not like one party is saying this is bad and the other is saying it's good. I mean, everyone wants privacy, and so um, CCPA pretty much opened the floodgates, and we're essentially going to be seeing this now at every state level. We've kind of bypassed the federal government. I think the idea of the federal government doing this, I think it's, it's time's already passed. That's just my personal opinion, but I think that the history will bear that out. We've also received several questions kind of in addition to this. After the U.S., are you aware of any laws for Canada as well? Well, Canada just updated it there. Uh, they're breach notification law, which is great. My guess is that because they're in federal law, the Pepeda or Pepita or however you guys pronounce it, that is getting a little long in the tooth. I mean, that came out 20-something years ago when the Data Protection Directive did. So, I mean, it was great back then. It has just not worn well, I think. So I think you can expect that there will be changes. And certainly there can be changes at the provincial level because of how federalism works in Canada. They could easily have a provincial law that essentially becomes their own a strengthened version of Petita. So I do expect to see changes. I just don't know when. Through the summary and the conclusions, and then we'll just take as many questions as time permit, and then whatever we miss, I'll put up on the on the blog next week after I wrap up at RSA. So security standards guidelines. I mentioned this earlier. You have all kinds of things to choose from. I like uh, CSC Top 20 only because the state of California indirectly endorsed it. I mean, they didn't say we endorse it, but they, they essentially said, if you're not using CSC Top 20, then how could you be, be reasonable? I love CSC Top 20, but others are great candidates. I love NIST 171 on the confidentiality side of things. GAPP, I mentioned that earlier. And business partners require vigorous policing. Folks, if you get in trouble at all, it's because your business partner did something dumb. Okay, it's just flat out, I guarantee it. Your business partners, because, I mean, look what happened here with uh, with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. These guys were running amok with this data, and it created a lot of uh, unhappy people because of the, uh, the elections, the way they went in a certain direction. So police those folks, including audits, and don't let them tell you that there's nothing to audit because it's all cloud-based. That's a lot of nonsense. You can audit policies 
and uh, and look at all their policies and see if they've put any effort into them. So don't buy that when someone says, oh, everything's in the cloud, you can't, nothing to see here. So let's go to the next slide. Here again, this is my experience over the last four or five years in really digging deep into privacy. I have found that organizations do not understand the nature of personal data. They, they think everything's a social security number. Not the case at all. If you look at CCPA, the list is massive. It's even more massive than that of, of the EU. Okay, uh, There's so many things that are now personal data. Even inferences about personal data are personal data. And that's something even the EU hasn't come out and said directly. So it's fascinating. Most organizations don't know where personal data is in their information ecosystem. Because uh, what happens is that projects get stood up all the time. They want up personal data winds up on a server in the middle of nowhere. People forget about it. They leave, and now you've got an opportunity for the bad guys who are very good at finding personal data. They are experts. You have to be just as good as they are. So organizations don't know with whom data is being shared inside or outside the organization. We saw that with the Facebook case. I've worked with clients before where uh, the data protection officer, if you will didn't have a copy of any of the contracts with third parties to whom data was being licensed or shared. Uh, doesn't really help you if you don't have contracts so you can go police the contracts. I really was a bit surprised at that. They're not well prepared to legally share personal data, meaning that they don't spend a lot of time essentially imposing contract terms that they understand on third parties to make sure they understand what is being asked of them. So they're just not really well prepared. Oftentimes, as the case is that legal gets brought in the last possible minute, and this drives me bonkers, folks. Don't call legal at the last minute and, uh, and say, hey, would you sign off on this? It just it doesn't inert anyone's benefit. You've got to bring legal in as soon as you start talking to a third party because I've engaged in, I remember one case, I spent six months negotiating with a third party. It went on and on and on. And finally, they, they relented, but that's how long it takes sometimes. So don't wait and call legal the last second. It just won't help you. And most organizations, not well prepared to address a data breach. A lot of organizations are good on the information or incident response piece, which is battling the bad guys because that's sexy. But as far as the sundry stuff of working with third parties, calling the authorities, doing all that fun stuff, not so much. Not able to focus team efforts to protect personal data. What you're gonna find is that a lot of organizations just have not trained together, as it were, for whether it's breach response or really for anything else until recently. So they don't have a good history of working together. My experience is that for GDPR, every department was involved. So you had InfoSec, you had regular IT, you had legal as a primaries, you had HR certainly as a primary, marketing as a primary, and then secondary ones like your lines of business. Unless your lines of business were information itself, then they were intimately involved. So the net net of it is that if you can't focus your team efforts you can't create that unity of command that you really need to be effective in having a data protection program. That's the end of that. We've still got five minutes left, and I will answer questions until we run the clock out. Awesome. Uh, question is, is the DHS US CERT the best place to get timely notification of serious threats? Is it the best place? I don't know if it's the best. It's a very good place. And I can't think of any other that's better. Certainly, if anyone you disagree with there, feel free to send me an email and I'll be happy to share. But it's an excellent place to go and get information that's timely. You have to subscribe to some service they have, but I highly recommend it. Awesome. Have you used the ISACA GDPR audit program? And if so, how do you feel the audit program covers GDPR regulations? I have a lot of respect for ISACA. I've read a lot of their materials. I think here's the challenge that you always have is when you look at an audit program of any kind, and again, I'm biased because I'm a lawyer, you've got to run it by legal. Because What I found a lot of the problem was with GDPR is that 95% of it is legal and 5% is traditional InfoSec. And so you find a lot of organizations, and I'm not picking on ISACA, that's true for, for a lot of them, where I think they were drifting into the realms of offering legal advice or, or legal analysis without the benefit of really having that background. So I think whenever you look at any program, whether it's ISACA or even something that NIST is, is offering, you've got to work with legal and, and say, okay, here's what they're saying, what do you think? And I think if you do that, you're going to be in good shape. I would never rely on one audit program in a vacuum without bringing in legal to get their, their insight into it because there's just too many ways this could go wrong. And so many of the controls now that we rely on are organizational 
meaning contracts, meaning policies and procedures. And that is really legal's purview, of almost certainly. In fact, um, when I was in my three jobs ago at the defense contractor, IT wouldn't write any policies. I had to write them because they said that no one would listen to IT. It had to come from legal. So the net net of it is, got, uh, is it, whatever program you're using, make sure legal's involved. They're going to be involved anyway. You might as well bring them in at the outset. Great. Are state fines as significant as those imposed under GDPR? State fines can be, okay, especially CCPA fines. And here's why, because they're doing it on a per record basis. So if you have a million records that are, and which is not anything unusual, think about, you know, if you have a popular app, how many app users you've got. So it potentially is even worse. Um, it's just that because it's on a per record basis, it's not as scary looking uh, on paper like GDPR is but potentially it's going to be much higher. Uh, it's really a question of how, how vindictive, if you will, the state attorney general wants to be. So keep that in mind as well. If they're really angry, they're going to let them have it if someone's messed up bad. So, and that's for all attorneys general, not just for California, but certainly it's possible in any case. So, so don't be lulled by the per record. Fine, it doesn't look scary. It's potentially very much so. Okay, and then one more question I think we have time for. Do you suggest um, that they study the AICPA, is it COSO guidelines to help set up organizational controls? Well, again, I love love COSO. Okay, it's great. I tend to see it as very SOX oriented though. And AICPA has a great, well, they're the purveyors, of, if I'm not mistaken, of, of GAPP, Generally Accepted Privacy Principles, which, by the way, there is a privacy maturity model they also developed that for some reason no one uses. And I don't know why, because it's great. I, I highly recommend both of those. Please, when you get off the call here, go to the AICPA, and I think it's CACPA for the Canada folks, and go look at those. Uh, GAPP is great, and the PMM is great. So highly recommend it. I think it will serve you well on the privacy piece of things, and certainly will help you on other endeavors, like if you're doing Privacy Shield or something like that as well. Perfect. We received quite a few questions. Apologies to all those that we weren't able to answer any of these live on the air. As Scott mentioned, we will have those in a blog post of next week, and then we'll also be contained in the follow-up email that you'll receive with the webinar recording and the PowerPoint slides. So huge thank you to all of you for joining us again today. Thank you to Scott for a great presentation. We hope to see everyone at future webinars, and uh, thanks again. Have a great day.